Good morning, Saints of Trinity Lutheran Church of Springfield, Illinois. Before I get to the sermon proper, I want to thank all of you for the welcome that you have shown Bridget, David, and I as we have uh, come here to join you. We want to thank all of you who joined us last week for the ordination and installation service, whether here in person or online. Those who came to the reception afterwards, who helped put on the reception, uh, we are simply overwhelmed with the love that we have felt already and are so excited for the ministry which God has called us to, to join here at Trinity. So will you please, please pray with me. Now may the words of my lips and the meditations of the hearts of all those gathered here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this day has been a long time coming, hasn't it? For four years of seminary training, I have been preparing to come and preach. For the years of your vacancy, you have been praying We've been praying for each other even though we didn't know it. And in seminary, they have us preach a fair amount. Uh, by my count, I've preached somewhere around 50 sermons. Uh, but this is different. Today is different. It's not like any other preaching occasion I've ever uh, preached at. Uh, not only is it my first sermon as a pastor, but it is my first sermon as your pastor. And that's a really important thing to remember and to think about because you're my people. I'm your pastor. God has brought us together to love, to care for one another, and to be on mission together in Springfield, in Illinois, and in all the world. So I've had a few nerves this week preparing for this sermon. And on top of that, I remembered something one of my seminary professors told me and said that this is your first impression. This is your chance to set the tone for your ministry. Cool. <laughs> no pressure. But then as I'm beginning my study, I read the gospel for this week. And even though it is a parable I've heard a hundred times, I've heard it preached on a hundred times, I've read it, I know what this parable is about. But this time, it hit different. And one of the cool things about this parable is that we don't have to guess what it's about because Jesus gets to unpack it for us. He lays everything out right for us in the text. Spoiler alert. No matter how hard I try to perfect every word of this sermon, no matter how eloquent my speech is, I don't control how you hear and receive God's word. Preaching and teaching is just sowing the seeds and letting the Holy Spirit do his work to work on the hearts and minds of all those who hear God's word, to work on your hearts and minds. So this is what the parable is about. And what it does is it answers a question. Why don't people believe in Jesus? Why don't they believe his message? Why do they not believe that he is the son of God who raised from the dead and has taken away all the sins of the world. Now it'd be easy if I could just end the sermon right there. Go forth, sow the seed. But there is a little more we can learn. And so as we're thinking about this, who is the sower of the seed? In the immediate context, it is Jesus. In his ministry, traveling through Judea, preaching, teaching, performing miracles. And he's explained to the disciples, who I'm sure are wondering, what is wrong with these people? Don't they know they've got the Messiah right here? 
and yet there are still people who don't believe. There are still people who say that he does works by the devil. He does healings by the devil. How can they not hear his words and know that this is the promised Messiah? But then there's a broader context of all of history. The sower is the church. The sower is the apostles, the church fathers, pastors, church workers, teachers, deaconesses, and you. You too are sowers of God's word in your God-given vocations. And that may look different in your context. It certainly looks different for me now. But you too are go out into the world. Now, I'm not a farmer, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But I imagine that what's happening in this parable is neither the normal nor most efficient way of planting seed, is it? Are we, do we have any farmers in here? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> you know, why would you just throw it out wherever? <laughs> you know, this sower doesn't even plow the seed. He doesn't even make sure that it gets watered and tended and grown. So it lands on the road, which if it's a lot like Monroe Street, I imagine there's not a whole lot that's going to grow there. And then some lands on rocky soil. Well, that doesn't allow for a lot of growth. Among weeds and thorns, and some of it lands on good soil. About a quarter of it, let's say. That seems like a waste, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be better to really just focus on that good soil? That soil you know is going to take root and flourish, and then maybe plow it, water it, tend it, weed, prune it. Uh, that would make sense to us, right? And I mean, if we're looking to, for efficiency, three-fourths, three-fourths of your... Uh, labor is non-productive. And in your own work, in your own lives, if you spent three-fourths of your time at work not being productive, how long would you have a job? Or if you went out to mow your lawn and you had the mower running the whole time, you mowed the whole lawn, but only a quarter of your lawn was mowed? It's not an efficient way of doing things, is it? But efficiency is not what Jesus is going for here, because efficiency is not the point of the parable, and it is not the way of God's kingdom. The point is not that you sow the seed so you get the maximum return on investment, the maximum growth. The point is you sow the seed and there is fruit that will be born, and fruit that is not born. And I think for a lot of us today, that's hard to think about. Because we live in such a fast-paced world where you need responses immediately. You need to maximize your time and efficiency. Every minute of every day has to be spent productively moving towards some goal, some benefit, and eliminate all the inefficiencies of our lives. That's why we eat lunch at our desks, why we very quickly run through the drive through why we try to multitask all the time, because everything we do today has to be productive. There needs to be some tangible, clear benefit some way to maximize your efficiency. Even your hobbies have to be monetized in some way. You can't just enjoy things anymore, especially in my generation. 
There's an entire industry of people who no longer play video games for fun and for relaxation, but they spend their time streaming them, recording them so that they can earn money. And what was once fun and relaxing has become a job. And that can even extend to how we think about the church, where we want to make sure everything we do is efficient, is productive. We want to make sure that we don't waste our time or our energy, which leads to a temptation that maybe we don't try new things. Maybe we don't try something or we don't do something because we just don't see how it's going to benefit us. We don't see how we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. So I want to use an example that I heard about in seminary about a church. Let's call it Trinity. This is just an example, by the way. This is not based on real life. Uh, That put on, they wanted to attract more members. So they put on this huge community event. They want to show their city who they are, what they're about, want to show how much fun we have, everything we have to offer. So they book the entire downtown, put on this huge festival, this huge event, includes a service project, food, refreshments, and the entire town comes. They have a great time. They make connections, they talk to people, There's a prayer, and they're thinking, all right, this week, the church is going to be packed. We just met all these new people. They're all going to come join our church. And Sunday morning comes, and there is not a single new person in the pew. The congregation is demoralized. They're wondering to themselves, what do we do this for? Why did we just spend all this time and money and energy to bring new people to the church and no one's come? And so then they, next time, they pull back a little bit and pull back a little bit and pull back until eventually they have no community presence anymore. But what they didn't know was that at that first community event, Someone heard the word for the first time. Someone heard the gospel. They heard about Jesus who loves them, who died on the cross for them, who took their sins away and restored their relationship to the creator of all things. And maybe he didn't come back to their church. Maybe he was just visiting and he went back to his hometown But six months later, he couldn't stop thinking about this Jesus guy. And he wants to continue learning. So he goes to another church. And there, the Holy Spirit works. There, fruit is born. And who knows what impact one person hearing the gospel for the first time will have. Now, we don't know how the Holy Spirit is working. We don't know what he will do. And so, sometimes we just have to do something. We need to take some risks. Maybe we didn't do things like this before, but now we are. Now, before we get too crazy, does this mean we just throw caution to the wind and just every idea someone has, we do it? You know, no. Because we're still called to be stewards of what God has given us. We are called to be good stewards of our time, talents, our energy, our finances. So we do need to use wisdom. But maybe we don't think about the efficiency of things anymore quite so much because efficiency is not what Jesus is going for because making disciples is not an efficient process. It's relationship building. It's long-term investments. 
It is love and generosity. And this parable is the perfect picture of Christ's love and generosity to a world which is fallen into destruction. Because he doesn't invite just the folks who are sitting in Sunday morning. He invites all peoples to the knowledge and truth of salvation through his blood on the cross. He bridges the gap between God and man so that we can be one with him and one with the Father. It seems like a waste that the Son of God would shed his blood for a world which rejects him and which persecutes his church. And yet, his love is so great that grace is free to all who hear his word, all who believe. Parables reveal the truths of God's reign, and this parable reveals that in God's kingdom, grace will always trump efficiency. It's wild to me that even during Jesus' earthly ministry, people witnessed his miracles, still rejected him. Even after he rose from the grave and ascended, there were still people who rejected him. But this parable tells us why that is, why people still, to this day, do not believe in Christ, despite all the workings that he does. Why, even if people were to see today Jesus' miracles, they might not believe. And the ultimate mystery is that the Father hides himself and reveals himself only through the Son, who alone makes the Father known. And so the word is sown and it falls on the hearts of man. It falls on the hardened and stony hearts. It falls on the rocky hearts, which have cracked and allow that word to come in, but take no root. It falls on those hearts which are overgrown with weeds and thorns, with the cares of this world, with the temptations, with making sure that I live my best life. And it also lands on the hearts which are tender, the hearts which have been broken, the hearts which need this word, which receive it joyfully, and find that there is a Jesus who loves them, who has shed his blood for them, and who promises them that they are his brothers and sisters, joint heirs. And those hearts will bear fruit 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. We just don't know which hearts those are. So like the sower of the parable, we cast the word out in whatever way is appropriate whether it is preaching from the pulpit, whether it is in individual conversations, whether it's raising your children, or even just living life as a Christian publicly. Even that sows the seed because people will see that you live different, that you're not just like everyone else. And so just as the apostles did, just as Christians throughout all time have done, we take the gospel to the world. And it will spread like wildfire, just as it has. It will change the hearts of man. It will change societies, just as it always have. But we don't have to worry about the results. That's not our job. That's his job. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to work on the hearts of man. We just go out and do the work. 
And we trust the words of Isaiah, who tells us that the word of the Lord will not return empty, that it will go out and it will do what he purposes it. We just finished our sermon series on gift for more, and we are still working through that in our Bible study. And it's all about how you, each and every one of you, are uniquely gifted with gifts to share, both in the working in the church and the work out of the church. Jesus' mission to spread the gospel, to witness to a world which is broken and needs him, to know that he is the Lord of all creation, that he has paid for their sins. And how you put those gifts to use will look different. You know how best to witness to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to your friends. It can be hard. It can be scary because we live in a world where we are going against the grain. We are going swimming against the tide. But who knows how the Lord will work through you? Who knows what small act of love and kindness, what word you give will affect the hearts of others and create faith and how that person through the Holy Spirit will make a greater impact and the fruits will be born 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. We have the easy job. We just get to live as God's people, as heirs of the kingdom, and let the Holy Spirit do his work. May it be so for Christ's sake now and forevermore. Amen.